In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into product development. We're going to go through and design this product, which I call the Tank Friend. It's a water tank monitoring system that's very simple and very easy to use. Living here in Southeast Asia, you see water tanks everywhere. I did a little bit of uh, statistical demographic analysis and came up with a number that in Thailand alone, there are 20 million water tanks. It's an insane number. And imagine how many there are in Southeast Asia as a whole. It's, it's staggering. And the one thing I have consistently noticed is that nobody has any kind of water level monitoring system. Like nobody has any idea how much water is in these tanks. And I find that fascinating. So I went down the rabbit hole and started researching these products to try to understand why they're so poorly adopted. And pretty much the reason is they totally suck. This was a lot more confusing and complicated than we thought. First of all, can we even get the range that's advertised on some of these things? I think that's a real problem. And the range was pretty disappointing. We're certainly not asking more of this monitor than it's stated it will do. So 50 feet maybe? So we're about a third of the way, maybe to the tank. That looks like it's not updating, so. So nothing happened at the house. Nothing happened a third of the way up and nothing happened at the time, at uh, two thirds of the way up. We need to change our slogan. So now let's just kind of hang out with it here for a second and just see if it actually updates from three inches away. Uh, no, the answer is no. <laughs> Why would it? I mean, it's 62 bucks. I think this one was $149. I think the price tag was around 350. This one is $499. And that's just for the basic system. It's expensive. Tank's not full. Yep. And this is showing empty. So this is showing full and that's showing an error, which makes no sense. I, did. I thought it was a reading and it turns out it's pairing. This is so confusing, guys. There's a couple of different sets of instructions and it's the same company and the sensors are all real similar. So it's easy to kind of get confused about what's what. So it seems to have stopped. Which is confusing because if you open it and the warranty's void, that doesn't make any sense. So far, we know the tanks are empty, so this full reading is definitely false. Not as reliable as we'd like. If two intelligent people can't figure something out in an hour, it's not worth our time, right? Well, yeah, I mean, this is definitely not something you want to rely on. I mean, we used to we used to sell it. Um, we, we field tested it uh, and then took it off uh, the market. We installed a wireless uh, water monitor. The transmitter at the tank has a battery in it that's not replaceable and it appeared to have died. It just stopped transmitting. Not being able to monitor the cistern water level just doesn't work. What comes to mind is that all of these water tank monitor systems are uh, designed not by looking at the real world use scenarios but by competitive analysis where a marketing and design team gets together and they buy all the products that are on the market and they look at them all and they make that matrix of check boxes of features and so on and that's it they don't understand that taking that approach leads you into this fantasy world where you base the features of a product not by how good they do the job but how good they convince a person to purchase the product in the first place. And that tends to lead things way off into the weeds very, very quickly. Now wireless is a really strong marketing point, but it belies a really short-sighted mentality. The idea is that you can avoid the expense and inconvenience of running wires. But what you're really doing is you're trading re reliability for a fantasy. Take, for example, the concept of the wireless doorbell. Now, when I was a kid, a doorbell was a transformer, a switch, a bell, and some wires. And it was bulletproof reliable. The only way you could kill it was to go and turn off the circuit breaker that powered it. But now, when you go to a hardware store and ask for a doorbell, they show you the wireless, convenient, easy to install doorbells. And if you buy into that, you're basically now taking 
the reliability of your doorbell and dropping it way down with this complex circus of technology. And when you think about it, a doorbell is really important to your life. Its failure can actually have really bad life consequences. Like when you need to get that FedEx and the guy comes and pushes the button and nothing happens, so he leaves and you're totally screwed. That's the kind of thing that makes me not want to embrace that whole idea. And there's also the environmental consequences. Now these wireless doorbells, if you think about like over five years, you're gonna need to replace a bunch of batteries and probably you're gonna have to buy that doorbell two or three times over that five year period because the little button thing outside is gonna get wet, it's gonna fall off, it's just not gonna last 40 years like the original did. So we're really going backwards on so many levels in the name of convenience. So before I started designing this thing, I did what any smart designer would do, and that's to really familiarize myself with the problem. So I started really looking at these water tanks, and I took a lot of pictures of them while I was traveling, and really studied how people use these things, how they install them, and the general gestalt of the problem. I set a goal of simplicity. If you can't explain how to install and use this thing with a single sheet of IKEA style diagrams without any words, it's too complicated. You've got to simplify it. The best metaphor I could come up with was the idea that the technology should just make the tank walls transparent and that the scale of the display should be literal. So no abstract translations of scale are necessary to understand what's going on. To display the water level, we opted to use a simple addressable LED strip that's exactly the same length as the water tank itself. This makes it incredibly obvious and intuitive when you're looking at the reading. To calibrate the device, you simply take a pair of scissors and cut the LED strip to the same height as your tank. It's as simple as that. In operation, the historical max and min water levels are represented by flashing pixels that remain on the display. A very common strategy used to measure tank water level is to use an ultrasonic transducer that gets mounted in the roof of the tank. It sends pings of ultrasonic energy down to reflect off the surface of the water. It then determines the water level by the time it takes that pulse to travel down, reflect off the top surface of the water, and then back to the sensor. The instructions for these type of gauges always contain lots of little warnings about how you have to mount this thing. For example, if you mount it such that the inflow interferes with the ultrasonic beam, it'll corrupt the reading. It also warns you not to mount the sensor too close to the wall of the tank, because that can also corrupt the reading. All of this is a lot to think about and possibly get wrong, especially if you're not a superstar in the field of ultrasonic acoustics. The tank friend uses the same sound pulse measurement technique, but in our design, we contain the sound pulses inside of a tube. This affords some major advantages in terms of mounting. We can mount the tube inside the tank, and we can also mount it external to the tank with a simple plumbing connection. The tank friend is vented at the top, so all it needs is a pipe that communicates to the main volume of the tank. Once we're confined to a tube, we can also use a much lower audio frequency, where sound propagates as a simple planar wave without dispersion and diffraction that ultrasonics would encounter. All types of sonar measurement systems have a certain minimum distance where they can't measure anything. It's just too close. This is called the blanking headroom. In the tank friend, we use sensing wires that extend through this zone so that when the water level gets too close, the microcontroller detects this and switches over to a different flood warning mode instead of getting a corrupted reading from the water being too close. The initial R&D effort was all about proving that a simple waterproof speaker and microphone could be used as the transducers. I designed and 3D printed a little cap piece that could hold the two transducers in the end of a piece of 40 millimeter PVC pipe.
The first step was to create a little pinger circuit that would generate sound pulses to travel up and down the tube. I use an H bridge in the microcontroller to accomplish this. Once the pinger was working, I started working on the general layout for the surface mount analog parts of the circuit. I was going to prototype this in all surface mount because the final unit is going to be surface mount. I wanted to test the actual parts that I was going to use in the final unit. I used my tried and true scratch and sniff method for prototyping these boards. I can prototype this really quickly because I don't have to wait for anything. I'm just in love with this whole through hole wire wrap and surface mount hybrid concept. It just makes circuit prototyping that much easier. You can get to things, you can probe nodes easily, and when you need to make a design change, no problem. And the end result is really quite robust and reliable. Let's take a tour through the schematic of the tank friend and figure out how this thing works. It looks a little complicated at first glance, but if we go through it step by step, you'll see it's really quite simple. Let's start with U4, which is the pinger amplifier. This is really just an H bridge, which produces a bipolar pulse to feed the speaker. This is what actually makes the click that propagates down the tube. The 4 ohm resistor is there to limit the current to a reasonable level. If we wanted to change the output volume of the click, we just change this one resistor. Now let's take a look at the input section of the tank friend. A standard condenser microphone serves as the sensor, picking up the reflected sound pulses inside the tube. The low level microphone signal is amplified by U2A and U2B. These are configured as a high pass filter as well to help eliminate low frequency noises. Both of these amplifiers are referenced to a virtual ground which is half the supply voltage. This puts the idle voltage at 2.5 volts right in the middle of our 5 volt rail. U2C forms an active half-wave rectifier, which effectively slices the waveform in two. This leaves us only with pulses going one direction, which is much easier to contend with. U2D forms the simple comparator, which is used to create the range pulse. It basically takes the incoming analog signal and compares it against a reference voltage, and it triggers whenever the signal exceeds the reference voltage. Since the return echo signal varies dramatically in amplitude depending on how far down the tube it has to travel, we need some way to make this reference voltage track the incoming signal so that it always slices it in the same place. U3, B, and D form two identical sample and hold peak detector circuits. These feed into U3A and U3C, which forms an analog OR gate, which passes the higher of the two voltages through to the output. This analog voltage goes through a voltage divider, which knocks it down by about 20%. This signal is fed to the comparator. So now the comparator has a reference which is always about 20% below the expected peak voltage. So it will always trigger near the peak about 80% of that incoming signal. The alternating blanking signals blank A and blank B alternately discharge the two storage capacitors. 
This allows one capacitor's voltage to be used to slice the current incoming pulse, while the other capacitor is discharged to allow it to capture the peak of that pulse. This way, the system tracks and always has a reference level equal to the peak of the last pulse it received. Most of the circuitry past the first two input amplifiers operates off of a different virtual ground, which is set at about 800 millivolts. This is so we have plenty of positive headroom as we are processing mostly positive signals after this point. It also allows us to easily clamp a node to ground using just a silicon diode connected to an I.O. pin. This is how the signal blank C shuts down the sample and hold system so that noises and glitches outside of the sampling window don't charge up the capacitor, which would ruin the reference level for the next pulse. The remaining circuitry consists of U5, which is a simple switch mode regulator that takes the 24 volt input and makes 5 volts out of it. Then we have a simple current loop transmitter formed by Q1, which is used for the serial data output back to the uh, remote display unit. The flood probe circuit uses an AC coupled square wave from an I.O. pin to drive one of the probe leads. The water conducts this signal to the opposite probe lead, which is also capacitively coupled, to a charge pump. This charge pump then charges up capacitor C5 to a level that triggers probe in when water is detected. This AC coupled sensing scheme prevents any kind of galvanic corrosion on the probe leads, which tends to happen if you leave probes sitting in the water with a DC current flowing through them for any length of time. Then of course we have that boring square in the middle of the schematic, which of course is the microcontroller where all the magic happens. Now you can see we have the guts of the waveforms here splayed out on the oscilloscope so we can really see what's going on. Starting at the top of the screen, this uh, green trace here shows the ping pulse. That's the ping pulse going to the speaker. This blue trace here, which is kind of dancing around, is the sampled peak amplitude of the returned echo. The returned echo here is this yellow signal which you can see is gated by blank C. So it's only when blank C is high here does the analog signal come through and get processed. Down below that, we have the range pulse, which is what comes back and gates the microcontroller's timing measurement to actually measure the time. The LED data here is the signal that goes out to the string of LEDs. You can see that happens after it's been measured calculated in this little window of time and then it gets sent out. So blank A and B are basically the two signals that switch the analog sample and hold capacitors back and forth as we use one to measure and store the, the other one and then flip back and forth vice versa. So that's the basic idea. And as you can see, as I move the reflector plate up and down the tube, you can see the range pulse moves as does the primary echo return. And you can see there's two other little echo returns here. These are reflections that bounce back and forth inside the tube. And down here you can see this one peak that really doesn't kind of move. That's actually a reflection from the end of the tube, which is open, that is caused by the sound that leaks around the reflector plate. When this tube is filled with water, you wouldn't get this return because it's a solid block. There's nothing, there's nowhere for the sound to leak around. But in this test setup, we have this leakage which comes back as this stationary pulse which never moves. You can also see, as I move up and down, this uh, bluish signal level tracks the peak amplitude of the main echo. So as we move down the tube, you can see the return level signal gets a little bit lower as it goes farther down the tube. And that is tracking the amplitude of that echo. So we always have a really good reference level to slice that return echo to generate the um, 
range pulse. So what I find really interesting here is that right now the range finder sees the open end of the pipe as if the water level was down here. But if I put my hand over the end, it registers the water level exactly where it should be, which is you know, right at the end of the pipe here. So what's happening is that an open pipe has basically like a high impedance and closed pipe is like a short circuit. And that causes the reflection off the end of the pipe to sort of switch phase a little bit, which causes it to see the end in a different location. All very fascinating. So here I've got this little contraption, which is basically a model like Hot Wheel car with a little piece of circuit board glued onto the end of it with some epoxy putty and some magnets on the bottom. So I just can use this little thing to drag this reflector plate up and down inside the tube to simulate the water level. So if I stick this in here, you can see the magnet allows me to drag the car up and down in the pipe, which registers as a different water level. Now, right now the magnet and the end, the reflector plate are about 42 millimeters uh, offset, which you can see here. Here's the actual location of the reflector plate. So if I take it out again, you can see that, right? So there's a bit of an offset there of 42 millimeters. So this thing allows me to evaluate and test this without having to pour buckets of water over my head. Mechanically, there's nothing terribly complex about the tank friend. It's basically just two plastic parts and a circuit board and a few extra little ancillary parts. The base of the unit holds the transducers, the speaker and the microphone and the two water sensing probes. The cap just covers it all up and waterproofs it and provides a place to mount the two connectors. The circuit board is modeled as some of the key element. I also model the switch mode regulator and the potentiometer because those were sticking up off the board and I needed to make sure that nothing would interfere with those things. I took the circuit board and modeled it down to the point where I had all the hole positions. This makes it easy for me to just make a DXF file and export it, give it to my circuit board designer and that way I know that all the holes are going to come out exactly in the right place. Alright, so now that we're inside here, you can see the basic structure. We have the lid, which has got the two connectors in it, a little interconnection wiring, the main board, which has the switching regulator right there, it has the microcontroller, it has the uh, ping H bridge right there. Uh, this is the gain control pot for the mic level, and then all this here is the analog signal processing and the two op amps right there. Now you can see that the two water sensing probes go right through the plastic and they come in and they solder right to the board. One of the things I want to change is these are just made out of some soft copper wire and they bend really easily. So we need to source some stiffer uh, wire that we can replace these with so it's more robust. But it still has to be something that can be soldered easily with standard electronic solder. The other thing we need to look at too is we need to create a better sealing system for this interface here between the body and the cap. That's got to be totally waterproof and, and not leak at all. If we look inside here, you can see the elements uh, that make it all go. We have the speaker in the middle and the little microphone up there. Now, I added this little bridge to the plastic here just 
to be kind of a mechanical guard that protects the speaker cone from getting crushed. And I think that does help to keep things out of there. Uh, these little bosses on the side are basically the ends of these PC board screws. They fit into there. Um, yeah, so it's pretty simple. We also have the uh, vent system. The vents, which are radially arrayed around the outside there, those just start out um, down inside there. You can see the vent right there and it just communicates right to the outside. And that just keeps there from being any air pressure developing on top of the water column. So I think I want to rethink this entire connector and wiring scheme. Um, assembling these wires and soldering it all together is just uh, too labor intensive. So what I want to do is maybe mount the connectors right into the circuit board, maybe from this side just have like little tabs coming out so it solders right into the circuit board. Much less labor and, and much simpler. Uh, so something like that, we'll, we'll have to re revisit that. But um, the next thing we need to do obviously is a lot of field testing. We need to take this thing out and really beat the hell out of it and see how, how well it performs and what harms it. So now I know what you're all thinking here. This guy makes a lot of clicking noise. It's kind of annoying. But in reality, it does not have to sample quite so frequently. So what I'm going to do now is reprogram this thing with some new firmware that samples the water level at a much more reasonable rate. So what I'm doing now is I'm using my programmer to download new firmware into the device so that it won't click quite as frenetically. Okay, so now it's going to be much more reasonable, really only clicking um, every 15 seconds or so. And you'll notice that it's two clicks. The first click really just samples the return echo level and the second click measures the actual time. Because it has to do two because the sample level drains off the little storage capacitor. So you need to space them pretty closely together to get that to work right. So I hope you guys enjoyed this journey uh, as much as I did. It's a fun project, a lot of things to think about. So I want to try to address my initial question, which was, why aren't these water tank monitor systems more uh, widely adopted? Well, I think it comes down to two main factors. The first one is obviously cost. Uh, people, especially in Southeast Asia, are very cost sensitive. And it's just not that important to know how much water is in your water tank if you have to spend a, a crazy arm and a leg to to get that capability. And I think the second factor is really that unless you spend really big bucks on a pro system, like especially the wireless units, those have better radios, bigger batteries, um, solar panels, they really are over engineered to deliver that performance. But that comes at a cost. Those things are very pricey and I think it just puts that out of the, the realm of feasibility for most people. And that pushes you down into the sort of the low cost entries, but none of the low cost entries really, I think can deliver the, the reliability that one would want from something like this. So you end up with something where the, the radio range is just terrible. You can't get it to work or it just dies in six months. It's just, it's very unsatisfactory and that just leaves a bad taste in people's mouths and they just, don't go there. So what I really wanted to do with this was try to hit that sweet spot where it's cheap, it's simple, and it's reliable. It's that trifecta idea of getting things right. So I hope I succeeded. So if you like this video, please click like and subscribe and thank you very much for watching.